If there's one thing we've learned over the last six quarters of football, it's that Penn State cannot win ugly games. Games where the passing attack, whether it's through the efficiency of down-to-down -down plays or explosive plays, if they can't hit those, this team, as it's constructed right now, can't really win football games. It's something that's going to come up again this year because even though they have the high-flying Ohio State Buckeyes on Saturday, teams down the line, including Michigan and teams like Michigan State, are going to want to run the football. And if Penn State can't win their way, if they can't dictate the flow of the game, this team has a rough time staying competitive. And we'll get into some of the reasons and some of the... the uh, factors that go into that and it's not just about the catch-all of coaching which is it, after a loss that's frankly embarrassing for Penn State football fans uh, there's more to it than just what happens on game day and we'll get into some of the ways the team is constructed and some of the decisions made about what the game plan is coming into the game based on what we do see on film on Saturday. So the first thing that I want to start with obviously is the offense for a unit that only scored 10 points in regulation, one that has routinely been getting into uh, the 20s and 30s throughout James Franklin's tenure. This was a low moment. And one of the things that happened is that I think not only not being able to win dirty, it's not just about it's not just about the defense, and it's not just about running the ball. It's about the patience of the offensive staff. And this is one area where I think Mike Yersich on Saturday tried to come into the game with a run-first approach. James Franklin talked about it. Seven of their first eight plays were runs. This team wanted to come into the game, and they wanted to run the football. But part of running the football is sacrificing efficiency. Again, this is about winning dirty, not winning uh, in the way that you're used to. And this is one of those things where I think in, in the third quarter, when we saw the game pressure put on Penn State, where they had a couple of chances to get big plays, at the end of the first quarter, they got some big passes that got their, their salivating for more of those big plays. It felt like it was going to happen that day. And then by the third quarter, they ran the ball exactly twice. Meanwhile, on the flip side, Illinois has no problem winning ugly. In fact, they prefer to win ugly football games. Ran the ball 67 times, even on drives where it wasn't working. They came back to it. They came back to it. Now, part of that is they did have success early, and they had success consistently. Penn State obviously has problems running the football. That is in no way a surprise to anyone who's watching this show or should be a surprise to anybody who's seen Penn State football play so far this year. And we'll get into that right now as far as why Penn State can't win in the trenches. This goes back to something during the bye week that we talked about of, of the systems that Penn State is running, when you look at the play-by-play -play gradings from PFF, when you look at the film, what they're doing better is more of the zone blocking. More of their players play that system a little bit better. Now, this is a little bit counterintuitive because on Saturday, um, some of their worst plays came in zone blocking, but then again, some of their best plays also came in zone blocking, so it's a more high-variance situation, which if that's what you... If you're trying to win a game dirty, you're going to have some negative plays in the running game. That's, that's a part of it. Here is the play-by-play -play breakdown of the zone and man splits on Saturday from the Penn State offensive line. Now, to... Put this in context, in the PFF grading system, 60 is average. So that means you stepped on the football field and either you did nothing or you made an equal number of good plays to bad plays. So you effectively graded out to a zero, not a zero meaning terrible, a zero meaning no impact. So as you can see, even on the worst, even in, in the margins of being good and bad, this isn't a dramatic difference, but it is better here in zone blocking versus man blocking. So Penn State decided, by the way, in this game to have almost exactly a 50-50 split between the number of plays they called in each of these systems. So when Penn State needed to get a third down or third and short, or they needed to get some tough yards, they went to their man blocking systems. That didn't work. That's a huge problem for them so far this year. And this has been consistent throughout the season. If you're going to be trying to find the wins in the margins, to me, this is a huge part of it of you've got to be able to 
make some tough choices and and find what your players are doing and accentuate those things. And I don't think that Penn State right now with the systems that they're running, you can't be completely predictable, but you can't keep doing things that aren't working. And one of the things they tried to do at the end of the game that I think yielded some results that were more positive, but it was a, in the case of a little bit too late, was in a last-ditched effort to find some productivity on the ground. They moved Juice Krugs to center, and they moved Mike Miranda over to his position at right guard. Now, uh, Noah Kane averaged five yards a carry in the final frame. There were more productive runs at that point. It seemed to be working a little bit better. Again, still some big negative plays in there, but they were able to move the football a little more effectively. And even in overtime, in the situation when they did decide to run the football, they had more success here. So that is, if there's one thing you can take away from Saturday where I think there might be some positive momentum for the Penn State running game, it might be that if that continues going forward, which is something that I didn't think Penn State would do and I didn't think would be a great idea. But Juice Scruggs seemed to handle the pass blocking responsibilities and all the uh, responsibilities of playing center pretty well in that fourth quarter and overtime. So if he can handle that and you can move Mike Miranda back to where he seemed to be more comfortable at guard, that's a positive thing. But at this point, through the season so far, Penn State has now officially played or moved every single position except for tackle. Both Rasheed Walker and Caden Wallace have started every snap for Penn State football outside of some garbage time versus Ball State. And this is the part where... I'm not a huge fan of calling out individual players, although it it happens. Uh, Caden Wallace is struggling at at right tackle. And I personally, I don't know that he, when I look at him and the way he plays, I don't know that he is a tackle. I think if you look at his, his skill set and his abilities, he might fit better at guard, but right now he's playing that position because there, there doesn't seem to be anyone that Penn State is willing to or is comfortable about putting out on the football field. But if we look at... Just his blocking grades. Again, we'll, we'll take a look at this from just the run blocking perspective. If Penn State wants to win dirty, here's one of the problems that their biggest, one of their strongest offensive linemen is just not a good run blocker right now. His PFF run blocking grade, as you see here, and if you're listening on the podcast, 39.4. That ranks 236th out of 236 Power 5 tackles that have started the majority of the snaps this season. Dead last run blocking amongst all tackles. That is being put in a situation where you're not able to succeed and just having to stick it out. And this is something that... I've said this a couple times now, but you have to consider all options at this point. If Sean Clifford isn't going to be healthy and you need to get movement in the run game, this is a direct detriment. And it's something that Penn State has not been able to solve so far in the 2020 season. They're hoping that Caden Wallace, who is a talented player, 6'5", 323 pounds, he's not a terrible pass blocker, but even then there are, there are plays where in true passing situations, he just is beat. And I, and I think it's unfair to him that he's in this situation of having to play tackle. But truthfully... Unless it's Bryce Effner, who's the only other lineman to see time this year, there's nobody else that Penn State has been willing to put on the football field. And, you know, I'm not a practice. I'm not making those decisions. But I would at least want to have that particular conversation if Bryce Effner can play tackle. Um, and then when it comes to the game specifically on Saturday, if you want to get more information, more in-depth breakdowns, including... Some film examples. My film review is up at blue, white, illustrated, bwi.rivals.com if you want to check that out because uh, it, we get into the running game and some of the more, I think, egregious decisions before the game that kind of tie into what we're talking about, about Penn State's plan of attack that they started with. First, first two series, seven of the eight plays were running plays. By the third quarter, they ran the ball twice. What does that say about what the plan was coming in and how quickly they abandoned it? Or maybe not how quickly, seeing as it was the start of the third quarter. But that is one thing I think Mike Yersich and the patience with the run game and James Franklin, the patience with the run game, this team wants to score points. And normally I'm all on board. That's absolutely the right decision. Setting up your offense to throw the football into win through the air with your senior quarterback is correct, but without 
the threat of him extending plays. Sean Clifford stuck in the pocket was not a guy that was ready and able to operate and win from that area. And that brings us into the second part of what happened on Saturday versus Illinois is that Illinois kind of worked over Mike Yersich a little bit. They were able to find the right plays and the right ways to manipulate Penn State's uh, pre-snap movement. Penn State uses pre-snap movement to determine whether or not there is zone or man coverage. And Illinois did a great job of disguising that, including some really, really deep fakes. They went all the way up to the whistle before declaring what sort of coverage they were in, and then they got into those coverages from unique ways that Penn State probably had not seen so far this season. And that comes from Mike Yursich, and that comes from Sean Clifford, of the plays that they were put in and then the, play, the way they executed those plays. Sean Clifford was not able to diagnose those coverages post-snap and make firm decisions with the football. That's why he held onto the ball. That's why he scrambled. That's why he had to throw it away, and there were so many burned drives. So if you're going to commit to one thing or the other, if Sean Clifford is playing, I think you have to commit to playing Sean Clifford the way, the, just the way you have all season. And I understand the injury is a part of the, the discussion, and, and I, you know, I genuinely don't know what level of, of injury he has, but... What we have to evaluate on film without that information is what we're going on. And the Penn State offense right now with the way the, the offensive line is set up, and again, those are coaching decisions of how they're set up, they, they can't win games dirty. Now let's talk about the defensive side of the football because this to me is one area where I'm, gi I'm giving the defense a little bit more leniency even though they gave up 357 yards rushing and that's with the sack yardage taken out. It is not a good day on the ground. Nobody can have a good day if you give up almost 400 yards rushing. That's just the way it is. And nobody's playing well. I think some guys were not actively hurting the team. Uh, Jaquan Brisker, Arnold Ebikidi was fighting hard. Jesse Lucchetta, they all uh, made plays. And there were some stops. And not every play is a total tragedy. But it it is the fact that Penn State because of the way they play offense, is not set up to win games in an ugly fashion without P.J. Mustafer. And this is really the problem with the way that this team has been constructed, is that if we take a look at the defensive tackles that are playing for Penn State this year, these are guys that have seen snaps on the field. P.J. Mustafer, uh, we talked about it all offseason, getting up to 326 pounds. Derek Tangelo, the other starting tackle, now he's the nose tackle. He's playing about 15 to 20 pounds lighter there at 308. Every other player on this uh, list here that you see, Devon Ellis, 303, he's 6'1". Kaziah Izzard, 295. Fred Hansard, whatever uh, level of health he has and whatever level of play he has so far this year, he's only seen a handful of snaps. He's 310 pounds. Fatorma Mulba has seen games only in the non-conference schedule at 296. And Jordan Vandenberg, same thing. A guy who just finished playing a spring football season at Juco College is 292. None of these guys are big, physical, run-stuffing players now that P.J. Mustafer is done for the season. They are built to be aggressive, quick movement players to stop the run through quickness and penetration and then to get after the pass rusher. So... There's In a game like Illinois, there's really no other players to come in. And I know Penn State fans are saying, well, why uh, why wasn't Penn State more prepared for a seven offensive lineman front? I do think it's fair to say that you knew Illinois was going to run the ball and you knew that they were going to be physical. But with Devon Ellis possibly injured, again, James Franklin said there were guys that were not available during the weeks leading up to the game. We don't really know if he was healthy or not. He did not play well. But the guys that played in the game that were available, they all played. Tangelo, Ellis, Izzard, and Hansard. All of those guys played, and at times, Penn State was absolutely as big up front as they could possibly be. Amin Vanover, who is an end tackle hybrid, hasn't seen a lot of uh, games this year. He played in the game on Saturday. They put in... Uh, players like Smith Vilbert, who's 260 pounds. They had Jesse Lucchetta lined up at linebacker at times. They were trying to find answers. It's just that at the defensive tackle position, without the threat of the lead for Penn State, these players just 
had a hard time competing in that game. And, and they were a large part of the problem for what Penn State was doing up front and why they were losing in these situations. It's not hard to stop six or seven offensive linemen. You just have to hold your gap long enough for players to get to the ball. And that is fundamentally what Penn State couldn't do on Saturday. Now, if you're asking, well, who else is there? Because these are the only players that have played so far this season. And most of them at the bottom of the list haven't played more than uh, 40 snaps and no more in meaningful games, truthfully. Well, here are the scholarship defensive tackles that have yet to see the field. Uh, most of these players, Hakeem Beeman obviously is the one that is missing through suspension, but Cole uh, Brevard is a redshirt freshman. Alex Fermanic played linebacker in high school. He's a redshirt sophomore. Uh, Joseph Darkwa, again, 6'5", 295, redshirt sophomore from Germany, still learning the game of football. Uh, there's not any answer on the depth chart or uh, you know in the in the locker room that Penn State hasn't considered. The only one would maybe be Brevard at 317, but again, a redshirt freshman, Penn State typically doesn't want to play young linemen too early, and this is a place where I would trust them that they, if, if they're not ready, they're not ready. But that's how you give up 395 yards rushing, including the fact that the Penn State linebackers, again, they're not really built for this type of game. Brandon Smith did not play well, but it's it's a thing that, He's been doing all season where he does not play well versus the run when players get up to him at the second level. He is a coverage player. Even in, in the game on Saturday, he played well in coverage. But in these situations, it exacerbated all the problems behind them, and they just were not able to stop the run. Now, again, you come back to the fact that they forced three turnovers and they put the offense in position to score points. So it does ultimately come back to the fact that the offense cannot find a second way to win at this point. So if they get into this situation again, unless something drastically changes on that side of the ball, Penn State's defense without P.J. Mustafer, and I, I know it's one player, I'm, I'm actually shocked by that as well. I don't know that they're going to win a lot of games in an ugly fashion. If they win, it's going to be with the explosive passing attack and Clifford playing well. Not to be too much of a downer, but uh, that is what they're going to be facing for the second half of the season. I'm your host of the BWI Daily Edition, Thomas Frank Carr. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And, of course, to our YouTube channel, Blue White Illustrated Video on YouTube. Hit the subscribe button and the notification so you don't miss anything like the Daily Edition or our other shows. I'll be back again tomorrow with the BWI Daily.